Welcome to this session on the economics of fractional reserve banking. Notice the title is uh, intentionally uh, excluding the uh, legal and political uh, aspects of fractional reserve banking, so we won't get into the debate about uh, uh, the legal status of fractional reserves and uh, the private property uh, uh, issues that uh, surround uh, fractional reserve banking uh, debate. Uh, I'll only mention a few uh, details about this with respect to the economic analysis. We, we want to focus just on uh, the economic analysis of <clears throat> fractional reserve banking. Uh, I might uh, also make a, another uh, uh, remark about this. Uh, uh, within uh, Most of you know that w w even if we confine ourselves to the economics of fractional reserve banking, that this is a highly contentious area where there's a huge literature of debate. And uh, so you know, we can't cover every nuance of, of this debate. Uh, uh, what I intend to do in the, in the uh, 45 minutes is to uh, lay out the framework, if we see some basic principles that should be accepted on all sides, and, and see what the implications of these basic uh, uh, principles of the framework of economic analysis happen to be. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with uh, what you already uh, uh, received from uh, Lucas Engelhardt uh, yesterday in talking about uh, money. Uh, he discussed uh, Menger's uh, theory of the logic of the development of money, the origin of money, out of barter. Uh, so let's uh, pick up the story there, and then we'll see how banking enters into this. <clears throat> so money, uh, we know, uh, we can think about the logic of this, must have emerged... Um, uh, naturally as an entrepreneurial innovation in a uh, pre-monetary situation <clears throat> where uh, uh, there were certain persons who were um, uh, had the entrepreneurial foresight to, to see that trading goods that they had difficulty bartering for more saleable goods would permit them to make their exchanges indirectly. And so uh, from this uh, beginning point, we get the development of uh, money itself. The next step in the development of money then would be uh, the uh, entrepreneurs would provide certification so they could run a business, in other words, um, stamping the metal and guaranteeing with their imprimatur the uh, fineness and weight of the metal. So coins would uh, be a... Uh, entrepreneurial innovation that could arise on the market. We don't need the state to provide these things to us, but this is just a natural development of uh, people economizing uh, on the market. <clears throat> now, of course, the particular business uh, arrangement organization by which coins would be produced, we, we could imagine uh, uh, different uh, scenarios. So we might have, for example, entrepreneurs who just run minting companies Right, they buy the gold from mining companies, and then they they mint they pay for the gold, and then they mint the coins, and then they uh, charge a fee, and uh, the mining companies pay the fee, and then uh, you receive the gold coins, and then they have they have money itself. <clears throat> we could imagine also vertically integrated um, business arrangements where an entrepreneur uh, mines the gold. And then, or, or silver, or whatever the commodity is, and then uh, mints the coins within his own organization. But in any case, the point is that this uh, production of money would be subject to the same uh, procedure of economic calculation that uh, Joe Salerno uh, spoke about earlier today as the production of anything else. There'd be revenues, and there'd be costs, and uh, there'd be a dynamic of production. So if it was very profitable to produce money, then the entrepreneurs would ramp up production of uh, money and the, the uh, uh, asset values of uh, mines would go up and they're, you know, they'd have to pull more workers into production and their costs would begin to rise. And as they supply more money on the market, the money's purchasing power would moderate and the uh, profit would normalize to uh, 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 dissipate, we should say. And the rate of return would normalize to uh, other production processes. So money, uh, money production in a market economy uh, would be regulated by profit and loss. It would be um, normalized or integrated into the production of all other goods uh, on the market. <clears throat> uh, okay, now from here we can uh, see the next development uh, with, with banking. 
<clears throat> so with banking, uh, we could have other entrepreneurs who uh, start up uh, businesses and they take the certification that exists on the coin and transfer it to another medium, like a piece of paper, which historically we call banknotes. So they would they would write a, you know issue a, a print up a piece of paper that would say uh, the X Y Z bank is uh, uh, holding in uh, reserve for redemption of this note five dollars of gold or you know whatever the money name would be in this system. <clears throat> so the certification wouldn't have to remain on the coin; it could be taken and, uh, on a separate. Uh, medium. Uh, of course, in our um, in our economy, this is done electronically, right? We have checking account balances. These are just electronic records of uh, the claims that we have, the redemption claims that we have to money proper. So we can go down to our bank and we can uh, we, we can ask them to cash out, uh, you know, a hundred dollars from our checking account. We go to the ATM and we, you know cash out two hundred dollars and. They they will provide us with this with this uh, uh, redemption uh, on demand at par. This, by the way, is what's necessary for money substitutes to come into existence. These um, certifications, these redemption certifications, <clears throat> if they are issued in such a way that they're um, available to the bearer, the person who possesses them on demand at par, then they could be accepted as. Uh, substitutes for money in lieu of money. Uh, this would be the case because the existence of these uh, certificates, a bank note or a checking account balance, provides uh, some additional measure of convenience and safety uh, compared to lugging around the coins themselves. And so the customers would be willing to pay fees to obtain the money substitute production, the bank note, or uh, to administer the checking account balances for the convenience of being able to swipe debit cards, you know, instead of lugging around gold coins or, or to, uh, you know, just carry uh, $10,000 worth of purchasing power in one bill that you can slip in your shoe and carry around anonymously and buy things as opposed to lugging around gold and silver. So again, this would just be a business. Uh, the bank would charge fees for the production of the money substitute. Uh, the money certificate, as long as, uh, again, uh, customers valued the uh, benefit of the money substitute uh, sufficiently, they'd pay fees high enough to cover the cost of administering the production and uh, administration of the, of the money substitute. So this would be all just uh, regulated again by uh, normal commercial profit and loss principles. <clears throat> so we know that this too would occur on the market. This is just the logic of the regular process of entrepreneurial decision making uh, on the, uh, you know, in the, in, in the uh, realm of economic calculation applied to these, uh, these elements, these monetary elements. <clears throat> now, let's uh, take a look. I, I want to do this just for comparative purposes. Let's assume, legally speaking, just for the sake of making a comparison, that the bank uh, issues money certificates that are, in fact, claims and not titles of ownership to the money. Now, th th so that's a legal issue that, again, we're not going to go into, you know, how that work would work itself out. But let's just say that. So I, I want to do that so that I can uh, make the uh, comparison and the contrast between this uh, effect that the issue of money certificates would have on the bank's balance sheet with the effect that uh, fiduciary issue, fiduciary media issue would have on the bank's balance sheet. So let's suppose we have a bank, and this is a, just a T account of what happens if a customer comes in and uh, deposits uh, $1,000 in his or her checking account. Uh, so, so money, this would be gold uh, or silver, whatever the commodity money is in coinage, and then receives a checkable deposit, an account balance in their checking account of $1,000. Right, so this sort of an arrangement is called a 100% reserve bank. Or, or again, our terminology before is this, this, this checkable deposit is a money certificate uh, because it's backed by a 100% reserve of money that the bank is holding uh, for redemption of the, of the uh, check, checkable claim. All right, so, so that, we, we can see that this uh, could be an arrangement that would arise on the market. Right. 
And then, and, and again, we've explained how, how a bank can uh, uh, financially uh, soldier on in their business uh, providing 100% reserve. They do this by charging fees to the customer. Right? So that, that's how the system would work. <clears throat> now, notice uh, the, the two points that I've made here, that the, money, the issue of this money certificate, the issue of the checkable deposit, leaves the bank both liquid and solvent. It has, it has an instantaneous liability. <laughs> the customer can come back anytime he or she wants and redeem, uh, redeem the checkable uh, account for money, and the bank has an equivalent amount of money to the checkable account, and so that can be, uh, their uh, asset can be uh, tapped to pay the liability. So they're completely liquid when they do this, and they're also completely solvent, right? There's no, there's no insolvency here. The, the nominal value of their checkable deposits and the nominal value of their money is, is equivalent. So there's, so there's no problem, right? Their, their asset values aren't, couldn't fall nominally uh, relative to their liability values when they do this. So the bank is, the, the financial integrity of the bank is intact when they issue money certificates. I make a point of this, uh, obviously, because if there's fiduciary issue uh, by the bank, then it, 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 we get a different result. And so, so again, this is, I'm setting this up just for comparative uh, reasons. The second thing we want to note is that the issue of the money certificate does not change the stock of money. So if we want to, uh, uh, if we want to add up the total stock of money that exists in an economy in any uh, point in time, we would add together all of the money, which in this case would be, again, uh, coins of whatever commodity, and then all of the money substitutes. But of course, if they're money certificates, like in this example, then the money proper is no longer serving as a medium of exchange. It, it's being held as reserve. Uh, by the way, this is a general principle that how we categorize economically a particular item that people, a particular good that people uh, have is the way that they use it. Just because a gold coin uh, is, in fact, a, uh, you know, a, an amount of gold and it has a stamp on it and so on and so forth, it doesn't necessarily mean that a person would always use it as a medium of exchange. So, uh, you know, to give you a modern example, I, I don't know this for sure, but I suspect that Donald Trump has, like, the first dollar he ever earned framed in, in a placard on his wall at his house or one of his many houses, I guess. <clears throat> you know, okay, well, that dollar's not a medium of exchange anymore, right? It, it, it's not part of the money supply. It's, it's been used somehow else in, in some other way. So people could, so that's what the bank is doing. They're now using what is, for other people, the medium of exchange, they're using as a reserve. And so if they take $1,000 out of the money supply in coins and they replace it, that's why they're called money substitutes, right? Replace it with an equivalent amount of checkable deposits. So the, so the total money stock has not changed. That's the point. The banks cannot inflate the money stock in a system like this. They cannot change the money stock. The money stock is completely determined by the uh, profitability of the production of money, uh, production of the commodity money. When banks issue money certificates, all they're doing is changing the form of the medium of exchange to satisfy the preference of customers. If customers like to have checkable deposits instead of coins, then more of those would be produced by the banks. And if people like to have coins, they like the physical connection to the coins, then, uh, then there'd be fewer uh, checkable accounts, right? But the money stock overall would not change. That's the basic point. Uh, by the way, here's a, here's a nice quote of, of this. Uh, uh, here, here, this person who I'm quoting calls calls the money certificate of bank money. Okay, so we wouldn't use that terminology because it's sort of ambiguous. Uh, the bank money just offsets the amount of ordinary money, gold or currency, placed in the bank's vault. No money creation has taken place. A 100% reserve banking system has a neutral effect on money and the macro economy because it has no effect on the money supply. Now that's not Mises or Hayek or Rothbard. That's Paul Samuelson. <coughs> so... On, on a few points, we, we can agree wholeheartedly with Paul Samuelson. So he understands this principle uh, as well. Of course, as we'll see later in the, uh, in the talk, Paul Samuelson thinks this is a very bad monetary system and that it would be great to have fiduciary media, uh, whereas uh, Austrians tend to think uh, the other way. 
<coughs> okay. Okay, so uh, in this system, we have, in, in this system of commodity money and 100% reserve banking, we have no monetary inflation, right? The production of money is completely determined, we said before, just by the economic calculation of profit and loss for mining and minting the commodity, whatever it happens to be. So in my, uh, in my analytics here, we have the purchasing power of money, money's uh, price, and the quantity of money. This is the total stock of money, the total amount of the money, uh, a commodity and the money certificates that are being used as a medium of exchange. At any given point in time, of course, that is fixed. And then we have a total demand that people have to possess this money as a good. And uh, the interplay of the total demand and total stock of money determine then the purchasing power of the money, just like it would for any good, right? Like the housing stock in Auburn, the number of houses that, pe that exist in Auburn, and the total demand that people have for houses in uh, Auburn determine the price of housing of, of a house in Auburn. So it's the same analysis, right? <clears throat> so the only thing that can, in can lead to an increase in the uh, stock of uh, money by production is if the total demand for money goes up. Because if the total demand for money goes up, then the uh, market value of money is uh, higher, and yet the costs of production are the same, and so there's profitability for producing more money. And then money production would ramp up, and it would moderate, as we suggested before, the price of money. Right? The additional supply would keep the price of money from being as high as otherwise. And the additional bidding uh, that by the entrepreneurs for the factors of production to produce this money would bid up the cost of production. And so at some intermediate point, we would reach a, a new uh, equilibrium or stable point. So exactly the same dynamic is in motion again for houses in, gross, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Auburn. So if demand for houses goes up in Auburn, then there'd be more profit for production. And the construction companies would, uh, would uh, ramp up production. They'd find more land sites and developments. And uh, by the way, uh, you can see this sort of thing going on around us this week, right? Uh, in fact, it's even, it's even uh, ramped up uh, beyond uh, just uh, uh, construction of houses. Uh, we see all these big building cranes around campus. So there's a massive building uh, activity that's going on here in uh, Auburn. <clears throat> uh, okay, so, so that's how... That's how money production would be regulated in this, in this uh, system. <clears throat> okay, now let's move on to the, to the credit activity of banks. So we've seen the monetary, uh, the monetary uh, function of banks uh, is first and foremost to provide money certificates uh, uh, that satisfy customers' desire to have a more safe and convenient form of the medium of exchange. <clears throat> Now, banks also perform uh, a credit function, and here they perform the function of financial intermediation, or their middlemen, or they intermediate credit. And we all know what middlemen do. Middlemen buy wholesale and sell retail, right? <clears throat> and the reason they can get this markup between the wholesale price that they pay to buy the products and the resale price that they charge to the customer is because they provide the customer with some benefit convenience and safety. We all know that when we shop at Walmart, it's, uh, um, it's uh, un unlimited returns, right? That, that, that's the big benefit. That's one of the reasons we shop at Walmart. Because if we, we can buy a product, use it for a week, we don't like it, take it back, get a full refund. You know, try doing that with the producer. A little more problematic, right? Walmart, there are, there are other benefits too. I, I won't go into all the details, right? It's the same thing with, with banks intermediating, intermediating credit. So I'm a saver. I would have a very difficult time uh, getting the best interest rate in the market because uh, you know Fortune 500 companies don't want to deal with me and my you know $2,000 that I want to lend. They'd have to have a separate legal uh, contract with me and so on, right? They just want to borrow uh, you know their hundred million dollars all at once from one lender, <clears throat> and so banks can pool these funds and provide these benefits and. And the wholesale interest rate that I get from the bank might actually be higher than any interest rate that I get uh, relative to risk, right? Might, might actually be better than anything else that I could get on my own if I just pursue on my own. Now, again, this is just, a, this is just an empirical question, right? We know that there's a lot of crowdfunding now, and th this sort of thing is c sort of providing some bypass for the little guy, for us, us little people, to be able to kind of directly uh, fund things and, and to get the retail rate. That's, that's great. You know, the internet sort of breaks down a little bit, the, 
the uh, the benefit to the wholesaler, uh, so we can bypass Walmart, maybe go directly to the producer and get these benefits, you know, get a better price or whatever it might be. Uh, but the point is, uh, if if that if that if these uh, innovations uh, wiped away the entire benefit, then there'd be no intermediaries, <laughs> right? So this is just uh, again subject to the same principle of profit and loss as any other operation of an entrepreneur on the market. As long as banks are doing this function, then uh, and earning this uh, interest rate differential, the, they, they earn their revenue stream and the differential between the wholesale interest rate they pay, I'd say a certificate of deposit interest rate that they pay to me as a saver, and the retail interest rate that they get when they lend to an entrepreneur. And if they're not able to get that revenue stream, well, then they just don't do this business, right? So to the extent that they do it, they're satisfying this um, uh, d demand that uh, savers have for these uh, benefits that they provide. So this is the idea. So credit intermediation in, in this initial step, you know, as we think about credit intermediation, we can see that it's, it, it too is regulated by profit and loss. Uh, by the way, I, I, let me make a side note here for those of you who are more sophisticated on this issue. We'll get to this in a minute uh, for the rest of you. But <clears throat> financial intermediation does not require the banks to play the yield curve. They're not borrowing short and lending long here. They, they, banks might do that, but that's not what we're talking about here. This is a more fundamental principle. They're, they're, just borrow, they're just borrowing at a particular time structure, and they're lending into the same time structure. They can even earn an interest rate differential doing that because they're providing services to the saver. You know, again, it's an empirical question as to how this works out, how these different elements work out. But here we're just pro providing the logic of it, right? It's, it's logically the case that this could happen. And uh, probably in history, this was, uh, uh, you know, initially how banks began the, the credit function. <clears throat> uh, okay, so let's take an example of this uh, to see this uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, <clears throat> so on the, again, on the right-hand side, we have a bank's balance sheet here, liabilities and equity, where they're uh, borrowing money from savers and they're taking out, the savers are taking out CDs with the bank, like a one-year CD, a certificate of deposit, and some other... Customers want five-year CDs, and other customers want 15-year CDs. And so they're going to the bank, and the bank's offering different interest rates for these based upon the interest rates that they can get by lending into the credit markets uh, in these time structures. And so there'd be a yield curve, right, with short, typically with short interest rates lower than long. And the, and the banks, if they're perfectly intermediating, they would just take the, the um, CD fund that's provided by the customer in a certain time structure and lend it directly into that time structure of investments. Now, again, they don't have to do this, but the point is they're, they're able to uh, precisely match the time structure of their uh, borrowing with the time structure of their lending. And again, this would leave them completely liquid and completely solvent, that is to say, as solvent as they can anticipate with respect to the payoff of these loans. There's always uncertainty involved in the payoff of the loan. But aside from that, the point is they're completely liquid when they do this. <clears throat> now, they may find, as a matter of uh, empirical matter, they may find that a lot of these uh, shorter-term CDs by customers roll over year after year. So maybe they find that 60% of the uh, old customers roll over the CDs or new customers come in and roll them over. And that may provide them with the ability to make longer-term loans on their, on their short CDs. But, but this is just an empirical question for the entrepreneurs to figure out. The point is they can remain completely liquid in financial intermediation. They don't have to borrow short and lend long and put themselves in an illiquid position. They, they, they might do that, but they, it's not necessary for them in order to uh, intermediate credit. Uh, okay, then the other thing, the, the other point, the last point on this is that credit intermediation also then would not change the, uh, the uh, savers, uh, the, the amount of uh, credit that savers provide. The, the, uh, the banks are simply borrowing that, that fund and then lending that, those same funds to investors. So they're not increasing the fund of credit from what savers are providing to them. They're just intermediating that pool of, of credit. And so the whole uh, structure of credit is determined by people, as we say in economics, people's time preferences, their willingness to save and invest the funds and postpone their current consumption into the future to earn the rate of return on the uh, investments that they make. And uh, you know, if you're interested in this area, we'll, we have a whole lecture on uh, interest later in the week. <clears throat> 
Uh, okay, so this would be the picture. How how would it be the case in a in an economy like this for let's say interest rates to move and the credit supply to change? Well, just like with uh, money uh, production, this would have to be based on a change in people's preferences. So if people prefer to hold more money, as we saw before, then they increase their demand for money, and this would make it more profitable to produce money, and then money production would, would uh, ramp up to meet this uh, increased uh, demand for money. So a similar thing happens in credit uh, markets. If people's time preferences go down, as I pictured it here, then they're willing to uh, increase their supply of uh, saving and decrease their demand for saving, and this would uh, permit the credit uh, supply to expand. And then banks would have more credit to intermediate. Uh, again, maybe uh, maybe the savers would uh, try to directly invest this or something, but, but at least the total supply of credit uh, provided would uh, be increased and interest rates would fall. Right. So, so that too is just part of the normal uh, process of the market. Uh, of course, the reverse could happen in both these cases, right? Demand for money could go down, the time preferences could go up, and then we just reverse the, the analytical effects. <clears throat> uh, okay. Now let's turn to the question of uh, fiduciary issue. So we see, we've just looked at the economics of how would the uh, system, the banking system function uh, what, what are the economic analytics of a banking system where there's commodity money that they're working with and then they're producing money certificates and intermediating credit? So we've seen that th this is a perfectly viable system of banking. You know, uh, it's a perfectly reasonable, uh, profitable, uh, potentially profitable business uh, line for entrepreneurs and they would come into this and, and allocate their resources just like they would allocate resources in other uh, lines of production. So now let's introduce the case of fiduciary media. And again, we're, we won't worry about the legal issues involved. Let's just say whatever is necessary legally to be in place, it's in place. And so now we have fiduciary issue. So how, how does this compare and contrast then to the case of 100% reserve? Well, here we need to see, uh, first of all, the fiduciary media comes into existence through credit creation. So this is the whole... Um, uh, profitability justification that the banks would have for issuing fiduciary media. So this is how we define fiduciary media. Fiduciary media are money substitutes for which the bank holds just a fraction of money in reserve instead of 100% reserve. Now in my example, they're holding on this uh, $1,000 of cash reserve, uh, the bank is holding a 10% reserve, right? They've got uh, $10,000 in checking deposits, but only a 1000 in a reserve against that 10000 <clears throat> Now, how do they go from 100% reserve, 1000 cash reserve, and 1000 in some customer's checking account to 10000 in the checking account? And, and the simplest way they could do this is just make a loan to one of their customers of $9,000. They just make a loan, and then they write the loan balance into that customer's checking account. That, that would be the simplest and most straightforward way for them to do this. They, they just create credit out of thin air. Notice they're not intermediating this credit. They're not borrowing these funds from anybody. They're just, they're just writing the money substitutes into the checking account of a customer who has come in and asked for a loan. And, of course, bankers, just well, like uh, any uh, businessman, of course, uh, knows that there can be... Um, uh, there can be additional customers that they could service at certain prices, right? <laughs> so it's just a question of, you know, what, at, at what price, and will that price be sufficient to cover costs? And if it is, well, then, then they're, the, the, the entrepreneur is happy to satisfy, or attempt at least, to satisfy this customer. So, so that's the issue, right? That's the question. Would the bank do this? <clears throat> and then, then we'll see there's certain nuances as to whether the bank can do this within the framework of the market. That, that's a different question. Here we're just saying, would the bank have incentive to do this? Are they interested in doing this? And uh, here, I hope you see right away that the, the uh, answer to this is clearly yes, uh, because the bank would earn the interest on this $9,000 loan, wh wherever they lend this, right? They're uh, charging interest for this loan. They're earning this interest, and yet they're not paying any interest to any saver to borrow the $9,000, right? So this is better financially than credit intermediation, at least on those grounds, it's better, right? 
Because if they're intermediating the 9,000, they'd have to borrow it from a saver. They'd have to pay the saver interest. And now they don't have to pay that interest. This, by the way, raises another interesting question, and we, we won't pursue all the nuances of this, but you might think about this. <clears throat> the bank, when it issues fiduciary media, since it just creates the funds out of thin air without borrowing them from someone else, it raises the question of who, who in the economy then has to reduce their expenditures on things in order to accommodate this borrower who gets the $9,000. This, this person's going to take the $9,000 and go out and buy something. And then somebody's not going to get the goods that, that, that they would have gotten had this person not been extended this loan, right? You see, when credit is intermediated, the person whose expenditures on goods goes down it, it enters into a contract with the bank to provide this, this funding. And so we know exactly whose expenditures are going down, and it's all contractually and mutually advantageous. But here, it's just, a, it's just people in general, right? By the way, this is very similar to the issue of uh, fiat money, which, again, we're not going to talk about <laughs> any length in this, in this discussion. But it's the same thing, a very similar thing, at least, when the government just prints, prints fiat money, right? Who bears the opportunity cost of them being able to spend it and get these additional goods that they get? And the answer is, well, there's just people in general who don't contract to do this, right? They're, they're being ripped off, uh, uh, right? They're, or, or to put it in neutral economic language, they're, they're having resources, uh, their, their wealth is being redistributed, <laughs> right? Away, without their consent, really. They don't understand even maybe what's going on. They just see prices rising and the, and the purchasing power of their fund, you know, their income is uh, dropping. So that's a big difference between the two systems, right? Fiduciary issue provides this kind of uh, redistribution of income or wealth distribution effect that doesn't exist in a 100% reserve system. <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, this, uh, this point about, uh, let's uh, uh, examine this point a little bit more carefully about the profitability of production here. So just to reiterate this. So the banks earn interest on the created credit, and yet they don't have to pay to bear the opportunity cost of the people whose resources are being transferred to the borrower. Uh, again, to use an analogy, it would be as if, you know, we, would, we could see clearly the inefficiency in this if we said, what if the government stepped in and paid all of the costs of production for a particular entrepreneur to produce his or her good? What if they paid all the costs of production? Then how would the entrepreneur's production decisions change? Well, the answer is pretty obvious, right? They'd ramp up production tremendously. And, and they wouldn't really care if that required them to lower their prices a bit to get more customers because their costs of production are negligible. Yes. So this is the sort of effect we get. We get, uh, we get uh, production outside of the realm of economic calculation. Now, this is the last point then on, the, on the slide where we haven't talked about this point. It must be the case then that the bank has some other principle besides profit and loss to regulate the production of fiduciary media. They, they, they must use some other principle besides profit and loss. Because they can't use profit and loss because if they say, let's make every loan of, with fiduciary media that's profitable to make, well, then they'll extend loans ad infinitum and they'll bankrupt their, their bank, right? They have to have some sort of arbitrary policy to say, well, we won't make loans in this area of the economy, or we, you know, we'll keep a certain capital ratio or, right, a reserve ratio or something like this to moderate the extent of fiduciary issue. So that, too, comes into play in this system and not in the 100% reserve system. There's this question of the uh, policy that the bank adopts to regulate the issue of fiduciary uh, media. This, this become, we'll, we'll see this is a very important theoretical point when we get to the end of the talk. <clears throat> okay, well, the other thing we want to point out about this uh, system is, of course, that fiduciary e uh, media issue makes banks illiquid. Now they have instantaneous liabilities that are much larger than their instantaneous assets. Right? They have checking account balances that are uh, payable on demand at par to their customers, way in excess of their monetary reserve. And so they're, by nature, illiquid. 
And of course, uh, banks in the real world, uh, and again, we're not going to talk about all these legal aspects, but you can figure this out pretty quickly. Banks in the real world then will lobby governments to provide them with some kind of legal protection to this illiquidity. You know, the guarantee of bailouts or uh, the securitization of their assets so that they can quickly sell them and, and become more liquid and things like this, right? So we get all of this, all of this uh, apparatus of intervention of uh, the states into financial markets uh, it, it can, uh, in fact, be a logical consequence of this kind of a system. In a 100% reserve banking system, we wouldn't have any of this. It wouldn't be necessary to have this sort of apparatus of protection of the banking system. Uh, the banks also can become insolvent because if the bank has 100% reserve and they're just intermediating credit, they're going to lend to the most credit-worthy projects and investors. But if they just create credit out of thin air, they have to lend to Borrowers that don't have the credit status to get the credit when they're just intermediating it, right? They have to lend to less credit-worthy uh, uh, borrowers uh, into projects that are less likely to pay off. And so they become insolvent. The, the quality of their assets is affected by a uh, fiduciary issue as well. Now, financial markets can become more volatile because this credit creation, as we know, uh, and you'll talk about later in more detail, the business cycle analysis, can generate asset price bubbles. I've already mentioned the building boom here around uh, Auburn. Uh, my wife was walking uh, downtown the other day, walked by a realty uh, store, and just uh, picked up a flyer, brought it home or back to the uh, hotel where we're staying to, to show me. It's a little dinky house, very unimpressive, very sort of uh, lower middle class looking house in a neighborhood right near downtown. They want $415,000 for this house. Four hundred and fifty thousand. This, I mean, this isn't New York City. I, Auburn's just is a little podunk place, right? It's well, it's bigger than my town of Gross City. But four hundred fifteen thousand dollars would buy you like the second nicest house in Gross City, but a great big, huge house with five, you know five acres or ten acres of land and uh, and so on. You know, there's definitely some sort of an asset price inflation going on uh, right here in River City. <clears throat> So, uh, so we get we get we get these asset price bubbles, and then of course this changes the profitability of production of these assets, and right. So construction equipment prices go up, and so we get we get the business cycle elements from all of this. Again, you'll talk in more detail about that later. The other thing is that this, this creates some uh, instability in the whole banking system because um, this house that uh, that I mentioned here in uh, Auburn at four hundred fifty. $15,000 is an old house. It was built in 1970s or something. And its price has probably doubled from what it was 10 years ago. It's not a newly produced house, right? It's caught up in the asset price inflation along with all the newly produced things. Simply because it's a, comp uh, it's a substitute good to the things whose prices have risen, right? So people just arbitrage between these opportunities. They don't, they don't, they don't go for the new house at a million dollars. They go for the older houses at lower prices and they bid those up too. And so now banks' balance sheets uh, swell. And the customers of the, you know, the homeowners go down to the bank and say, hey, I'd like to take out a, uh, uh, you know, a second mortgage on my house. I, I've got $150,000 equity in my house. And, this, so the, and the banks say, oh, sure, that looks great. $415,000 house, and now we've got you know, $200,000 mortgage on the house. Great. So, so that's how this whole thing uh, plays out. And again, you'll, you'll uh, hear more talks on this later, so we won't dwell on this. I, my point is that th this sort of thing doesn't happen in a 100% reserve system. This is a big difference between the two systems. <clears throat> okay, so here we then can uh, define monetary inflation in an analytically uh, precise way. Monetary inflation is not uh, any time the money supply increases. Monetary inflation is, is an increase in the money stock outside the confines of uh, economic calculation. There's, there's no monetary inflation in a commodity money system. There's just the regular production of money that responds to changes in demand. That's not inflation any more than we would call you know, an increase in the production of smartphones inflation when demand for smartphones goes up. No, that's just a regular market, right? But here we have a distinction. This is inflation. And what inflation does, of course, is progressively push down the purchasing power of money. So we would see this potential effect, at least, in the system of fiduciary issue. And it, uh, the very last thing that we want to look at in, in, the, uh, in this uh, time period 
is uh, whether or not this can be regulated. Uh, whether this in inflationary effect of pushing down the purchasing power of money can be uh, uh, kept uh, in abeyance in, uh, in a, a fiduciary issue system. Now, same thing happens to credit. So credit can be expanded just out of thin air. And so the supply of credit can increase. And uh, this will just push down interest rates, right? There's no necessity to have a lowering time preference here to get a greater supply of credit and lower interest rates. We can, the system permits the just sort of artificial pushing down of interest rates. And then uh, again, this uh, sets in motion the business cycle. Uh, so we call this credit expansion. So we can have monetary inflation and credit expansion in the fiduciary system. <clears throat> oh, another quote. The transformation into fractional reserve banks holding fractional rather than 100% reserves against deposits was in fact revolutionary. It led to the leveraged financial institutions that dominate our financial system today. Again, not Mises, not Rothbard. <clears throat> Paul Samuelson again. Imagine that. <laughs> the difference, of course, is that <laughs> I mentioned before, Paul Samuelson likes this system. He thinks it's great. Wow. You know, this is a wonderful revolution. Where would we be without it? Uh, this also, not to harp on Trump too much, but this is also his line, right? He doesn't like the Fed, but boy, he loves their low interest rates. That's great. Keep pushing interest rates down. You know why? Because their argument is this stimulates production. And again, the, the counter argument of uh, Austrian business cycle theory is it stimulates a boom that then, that then inevitably is liquidated, right? So it's a boom, yeah, sure, you get a boom, but then this is inevitably all you know, washed away by the bust. So you, uh, again, uh, that theory will be entertained uh, uh, in a later lecture. <clears throat> what we wanna do is just look at this very last point. Uh, there's another argument that's used in favor of the fiduciary system that's uh, somewhat more moderate uh, than this kind of Keynesian argument about you know, pushing down interest rates and <clears throat> expanding the supply of credit, uh, uh, permitting the you know, investment in more capital and making us wealthier. <clears throat> and this is uh, the claim that if we have a uh, free banking system with fiduciary issue, even if the base money, if the money, uh, say we had commodity money or even fiat money, if even if that base money supply were fixed, as long as banks are able to issue fiduciary media, then they will simply uh, issue it only to accommodate increases in money demand, as we spoke about before, and this would basically leave the purchasing power of money the same over time. So that's the claim that's made to justify fiduciary issue uh, by this group of uh, uh, economists uh, who base this claim on what's called monetary disequilibrium theory. The claim, the claim in the latter part of my sentence, where it says, otherwise, if you don't have a system like this, you can get harmful price deflation. So obviously, in a 100% reserve banking system, you could have a period of price deflation, right? Because the demand for money could go up, as we pictured it uh, on my slide, and the response of the increased production of money would be insufficient to bring the purchasing power of money back down to its original level. The purchasing power of money would stay above its original level. In other words, prices of goods would be lower. So it is possible. Now, let me just briefly uh, respond to how in the 100% reserve commodity money system, uh, what is the argument then, the kind of counter argument to that basic point? And uh, I pointed, as I suggested before at the beginning of the talk, it's a huge literature on this and a great big debate, so we can't go into all the nuances. But the basic point in response is this. It's certainly the case that entrepreneurs could uh, adopt a commodity like gold that was insufficiently, they were insufficiently able to produce enough to prevent a significant price deflation. What would happen in a case like this? And the answer is the entrepreneurs would simply select some other commodity as money. That's the answer. They would just select something else that's more readily produced. So they would just move from gold to silver. And, and that would solve the problem of excessive price deflation. The very question though is, who's to judge what's excessive price deflation, right? Is it the entrepreneurs who are actually in the business of producing the goods and so on? Or, or, or can we do this sort of abstractly as economists? Can we say, oh no, we need a system, a monetary system that keeps the purchasing power of money exactly the same, or, or you know, roughly the same? <clears throat> By the way, that kind of claim should strike you as extremely odd. 
W would we ever say this about any other good? Would we say, in other words, the ideal system of production for smartphones is that their price always stays the same? You know, we, we have a system somehow rigged in such a way that every time our demand for smartphones goes up, the increased supply just, just meets it at the point where the price stays the same. No, I, we, we think that's, that's sort of nutty. We think quite to the contrary. We think that, you know, prices are going to go all over the place, right, in a market system. There's nothing wrong with that. They could go up one year and down the next and sideways for several years. None of those conditions are particularly debilitating to the market. They seem to be all, you know, adequate. Now, get, remember, again, I'm not going into all the nuances here. There's a lot of back and forth about this debate. So uh, this is something we can engage in discussion about. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to, you know, sort of reduce this uh, argument to, to just these basic points. There are other things to consider. Uh, so anyway, uh, th this is how the argument uh, runs then. Uh, the, the argument is that any issue of fiduciary media that people did not want to hold, they would, they would then redeem. And that would be the mechanism that would keep the money supply exactly in sync with increased money demand. Money demand increases. And that allows the, the banks to circulate, if you will, or keep in uh, people's hands more fiduciary issue. And the, the people who get it want it because they're demanding more money. And so that would be the mechanism that, that regulates this system. Uh, okay, so what are the arguments against this? Well, uh, real briefly, again, the arguments against that mechanism, wh why, why do, would we suspect that that mechanism is probably not going to operate the way that... Uh, the proponents of this view uh, claim, is because, as Mises pointed out in Theory of Money and Credit in 1912, there are two cases. When we think about the issue of fiduciary media, there are two cases. One is a banking system which allows for the issue of fiduciary media uh, in response to money demand, and then there's the case of independent banks, and we'll get to independent banks in a minute. Now, if we have a banking system, what this means is that the banks make agreements with each other to um, hold and redeem each other's money substitutes at par on demand. And this would allow then for fiduciary issue to be increased overall in the system. Right? And that, but the question then becomes, what, what makes us think that it would exactly, this sort of system would expand fiduciary media to exactly offset the increase in money demand? What if the increase, what if it, uh, what if there was an over-issue, an initial over-issue of fiduciary media? Wouldn't it be the case that the borrowers would just spend the new money and prices would rise? And then at higher prices, that is a lower purchasing power of money, wouldn't, want, wouldn't people want to hold the additional money? That's what we pictured before in the slide, right? The amount of money that people wish to hold depends upon its purchasing power. And so naturally, if the banks overshoot the mark, then... And, and prices adjust to that overshooting, then the money will not be redeemed, at least not necessarily. The, the money substitutes will not be redeemed because people will want to hold additional money in the face of uh, higher prices for things. So that seems to be the point. And the same thing with credit expansion, right? Credit expansion lowers the interest rates. So, so fiduciary media can't adjust uh, credit to the needs of trade or something like this because the needs of trade depend on the interest rate. How much is demanded depends upon the interest rate. So if they over-issue fiduciary media, the banks do, and create too much credit, and they push the interest rate down, then, then uh, you know, the commercial interests are happy with that. They, they won't say, oh, you know, i got to pay back my loans. <laughs> right? it's, it, it, so it's hard to see exactly where the system is self-regulating. Okay, then finally, what about independent banks? What would happen in uh, Mises' second case? What if we have truly independent banks that don't form these alliances that allow for fiduciary issue to increase. Well, here we know that the clientele of each bank uh, would be strictly limited, and that banks would be interested in taking, uh, taking customers from each other, right, and, and building their clientele base. And so when banks get, uh, get money substitutes issued by other banks, the banks themselves would redeem them to try to injure their competition. And so we'd have, you know, uh, historians like to call uh, the period in the, the 19th century wildcat banking because they, because they don't like this sort of uh, competition. They don't like actual free, open competition in banking. They think something's wrong with it. But that would, be, that would be the case with independent banks. It's not clear at all that if you had independent banks, you could issue additional fiduciary media at all. Th this was, again, Mises' conclusion. 
he, he uh, thought that uh, if you had uh, real free banking with independent banks, the issue of fiduciary media would, would not continue. You would have basically 100% reserve banking for any additional issue beyond whatever the reserve ratio was that people would accept. So we know that the reserve ratios can't be lowered by banks just by issuing more fiduciary media, right? Which would allow them to accommodate more uh, credit creation and so on. In, a, in an independent banking system, it's customers, it's you and I who determine this, what the ratios are that banks can hold safely by our redemption. So this would not be a path toward uh, expansion. And finally, the only other way in which the money supply could be expanded is if there are additional reserves. But as we've seen in this system, the additional reserves only come through money production of the commodity. And, and so the banks, again, have no independent ability to increase uh, the money supply to accommodate increases in money demand. It just, it just wouldn't, uh, there's no mechanism for it to occur. <clears throat> All right, so at this point I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.